Chapter 23 One Last Training Mission Ever since the Kurt Waldheim was destroyed, the atmosphere at the Cape was very different. Inez could feel a creeping sense of dread coming over the workers as they frantically tried to finish construction of the Solaris and her two sister ships. The Solaris crew threw themselves into their training with a new kind of vigor, and everyone spoke in grim tones. The story, once it came out, was frightening. Two Partogan warships, destroyer-sized vessels, had somehow managed to circumvent the Earth Defense Fleet and get close enough to spring an ambush on the human flagship. The Kurt Waldheim never stood a chance, and was lost with all hands. For the first few days, there was confusion in the base. Just like everyone else, Inez believed that Earth and Alraki were still on good terms following their wartime alliance 50 years ago. She assumed this was a tit-for-tat response to the attack on the Mami Tamihana, a Partogan warship that was lost years ago to an attack by a human vessel. But then, Secretary General Etienne addressed the world. In a speech lasting just a few minutes, Etienne told everyone on Earth and in the surrounding star systems of how the Partogans were attempting to interfere in a minor conflict on the planet Amadeo, where the UN army was in a standoff with the droid army of the Mycor Empire. When Inez heard the UN was caught up in a distant war, she was shocked. We invaded another planet? Inez cried out with surprise. When the hell did that happen? Two years ago, I think, Central Officer Datsenko had replied. It's not a real war. If you lived in UN territory instead of Detroit all your life, you'd have seen it on TV. It's not something to worry about. Just a peacekeeping mission on a troubled planet. For some reason, Inez found she had trouble buying that answer. She wasn't sure if Datsenko was lying to her, or if he was just repeating a lie someone else had fed him. June 10th, 2086. Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Inez was spending some quality time with Cassandra at her residence in the Divine Atelier. Cassandra was quite fascinated to see that Inez lived one floor above what she called a sci-fi workshop, and wanted to spend her evening exploring. Of course, Inez could not allow Cassandra to go into the basement levels of the Atelier. Several technologies and devices for Project Prometheus were being built down there. And while Inez had clearance to be in the area, Cassandra did not. So instead, Inez distracted the young girl with a question. Do you want to hang out with me on my birthday? Cassandra jumped up and down and clapped her hands excitedly, bouncing with so much energy that the silverware on Inez's dining table rattled. Your birthday is coming up? Cassandra asked. When? How old will you be? It's three weeks from now, Inez replied. On the 30th, I'll be turning 22. Cassandra ran to the southern end of the room and pointed out a window, aiming at the distant shoreline. How about we go to the beach? Cassandra said. Coca Beach is right over there, and it's the perfect spot for a party. Dr. Spark said so. Sure, Inez said. June 30th, you and I will go to Coca Beach together. We'll get some sun and some surf, and maybe they'll have ice cream. I'll talk to Dr. Spark and make sure everything is okay. And who knows, maybe I can return the favor when your birthday rolls around. When is it? Cassandra put one hand to her heart and proudly declared, My birthday is December 25th. I'll be 11 years old. Inez thought that was neat. She knew that some important historical figure also had their birthday on December 25th, but she could not remember their name. About an hour later, Inez dropped Cassandra off at the former VAB and returned to the Divine Atelier. With only a couple of hours left in the day, she stepped down into the basement and spent some time in the workshop. The Divine Atelier's main workshop 
was a large room where UN scientists and engineers worked on psionic technology. Some of it was old, like amplifiers and mine shields left over from the Second Hyperspace War. But there was also some new technology as well, such as the conduit for the Divine Enforcer. The primary weapon of the Solaris and her sister ships was a gargantuan thing, but it only needed two people to operate. Cassandra, as the catalyst, would be inside of a miniaturized Prometheus engine, deep in the ship's core. Inez would act as the conduit. From her position on the bridge, Inez would use her psionic sensitivity, plus an Illyrium-powered device, to aim the powerful weapon at a target. In a sense, Cassandra was a living weapon, and Inez would be the gun sight. Absent-mindedly, Inez sat down in a chair at the far end of the workshop, where a prototype of the conduit device could be found. It featured two metal sockets on the armrests that Inez was supposed to stick her hands inside of. Through here, Inez would be physically integrated into the Divine Enforcer. She would aim and control the weapon by becoming a part of it. Inez picked up the screwdriver, opened up one of the sockets, and started tampering with the prototype again. It was very easy for Inez to connect herself to the conduit, but for some reason, separating herself from it was extremely difficult, and she always needed another person to help her get free. Obviously, Inez did not like this arrangement, and she was trying to change that. Inez was so wrapped up in her work that she was taken by surprise when a door slammed and a voice called out, Nezzy, are you down here? Don't call me Nezzy, Inez replied. Hi, Mom, I'm over by the conduit prototype. Scarlet Freeman ran into the workshop, weaving her way around the many half-built devices to reach Inez. The spymaster was looking extremely frazzled and harassed. Scarlet's hair was unkempt and messy, while there were very dark circles underneath her eyes. Clearly, Scarlet had been working without sleep for several days in a row. For just a brief moment, Inez could have sworn that Scarlet's eye color was different, too. Instead of her usual blue, Scarlet's eyes appeared to be the same shade of gray shared by formerly gifted people. Without waiting for a greeting from her daughter, Scarlet grabbed Inez and pulled her to her feet. Scarlet started talking right away. Nezzy, we've got a situation. We're going to pad 39A. I need you to do a job for the ISO. For me. Whoa, slow down, Inez replied. What's happening? I thought you were out hunting for whoever hit the Waldheim. I am, Scarlet said. But the Waldheim disaster is forcing the ISO to play their hands on a couple other fronts. I need to go to an important meeting in Oregon, but another op got rescheduled to happen at the same time. You have to go in my place. Follow me. Moving hurriedly, Scarlet pushed Inez out of the Divine Atelier and into her armored car. Once both women were inside, the driver pulled onto the road and started driving towards the Kennedy Space Center. Inside the passenger compartment, Inez found Central Officer David Sepulveda, who looked very tired. He was tapping away at a tablet computer until somebody spoke to him. Inez, listen to me, Scarlet said. The ISO is planning to run a major op over the next two weeks, but the agent flagged for the task got reassigned because the Partogans dropped a battleship on Germany. I need you to fill in. Wait, what? Inez said. Two weeks? What's going on that I have to be gone for two weeks? Nothing serious, David said. We just need you to take delivery of something and bring it back to Earth. Scarlet reached for a stack of paper next to David and withdrew a single sheet. Nezzy, when you were at the Banak base, did you meet a crewman named Adam Barter? Inez looked down at the sheet of paper. It was a photograph and brief description of a UN soldier she'd encountered a few times before. Oh yeah, Inez replied. I met him a few times at Banak. Scarlet nodded. And he was a client of yours at Binary Fusion too. Isn't that right? She said. 
Inez's eyes widened, and she nodded sheepishly. Scarlet waved her hand. No time for that. I'm just glad you have a rapport with him. That'll make things easier. Here's the situation. Adam Barter is an ISO informant. Not a member, just someone who feeds us intel from time to time. He'll be more inclined to talk to you than me right now, so you have to go with him. Two weeks from now, Barter is going to take possession of an important device. You don't need to know what it is, just help him get it back to Earth. Understood? Inez knew her mother well enough to understand that she was not going to be able to refuse this request. Like it or not, this was going to happen. I have questions, Inez said. Where is Barter now? And why only two weeks? Inez had quickly done the math in her head and was starting to feel optimistic. If she was only gone for a couple of weeks, she would return to Cape Canaveral just in time to celebrate her birthday with Cassandra as promised. Watching the landscape go by out the car window, Scarlet replied quickly. Corporal Barter is stationed aboard a battleship named Charlemagne. She's going out on a two-week training mission in deep space. Barter's going to receive the device on the last day, and then he'll bring it home. Now, I've already spoken to the captain. He's going to try to slot you into the same shift as Barter so you can work with him. Scarlet took her daughter's hand. Get close to Barter and then stick to him like glue. He's been assigned a shuttlecraft and a crew by the UN Navy leadership already. All you have to do is make sure nobody gets in his way and he gets his cargo to Florida without any trouble. And what if there is trouble? Inez asked. We're expecting you and the Charlemagne crew to be able to handle yourselves out there, Scarlet replied. But if it gets particularly bad, we have a quick reaction force on standby. They'll come to help only if things get out of hand. The armored car turned onto the Saturn Parkway and started toward the launch pads. Scarlet sighed and lightened her tone. Look, Nezzy, I know I'm imposing by dropping this on you last second, so I'll do something for you to make all this worth your while. You're going to stop calling me Nezzy? Inez prompted. Scarlet chuckled. While you're gone, I'm going to pull some strings and have Subject 2 rehomed in the Divine Atelier, the spymaster said. Dr. Spark's been keeping me up to speed on how much time you've spent with her. Once the Solaris is ready to fly, I'll need the two of you to work with each other on the regular. So I think this will be for the best. Inez felt a little more comfortable about being rushed into this job now. Knowing that Cassandra would be waiting for her just two weeks from now when she came back, Inez bounded up the steps to a shuttlecraft on pad 39A with a little extra confidence. She would just knuckle up and do the job so she could get back to what was important. She turned around to wave goodbye to her mother, only to see the armored car was already speeding away. This would not be the first time Inez flew in space. Back when she lived in Detroit, some wealthier people had taken her out on romantic dates aboard star yachts. And once, she had even slept with a man in his vacation home on the Sea of Tranquility. But she'd never been further from home than the moon. As the Navy shuttle sped away from Earth, Inez pressed her nose to a window and watched her homeworld slowly shrink into a barely perceptible dot, hovering in the middle of an inky black sea. About two hours later, the shuttle entered the outer soul system and gave Inez something else to gawk at. Jupiter. It was such a massive planet that it completely filled Inez's field of view. UN Navy recruits craned their necks and peered over neighboring seats to get a better look at the gas giant. In fact, their destination was so close to Jupiter that Inez started to worry the shuttle might enter Jupiter's atmosphere before landing wherever it was supposed to land. The UN Navy base at Port Armstrong could be found in high orbit above Ganymede, a rocky world bigger than Earth's moon. It was at the orbital dry dock where many of the starships found in Earth's military were built and maintained. 
As the shuttle drew near, Inez gazed out the window in wonder at the sight of the starship she would soon be boarding. The UNS Charlemagne was a super capital ship. Nearly four kilometers long and half a kilometer in height, she was painted with the colors and symbols of France, the nation responsible for her. Inez marveled at the image of a red, white, and blue hawk emblazoned across the bow above the words Armée de l'Air. The roundel of the French Air Force was painted over the conning tower next to that of the United Nations. Inez spotted not just gun turrets and missile bays on the Charlemagne, but holographic emitters as well. She remembered Central Officer Sepulveda's explanation of how human warships usually disguise themselves, and started to wonder what these holographic disguises would look like from the inside, so to speak. Boarding the Charlemagne went quickly for Inez. Someone, most likely Scarlet, had warned the captain and his staff that Inez would be stationed aboard this ship for two weeks. She was assigned a bunk and a galley, then placed in the same team as her mark. As it turned out, Corporal Adam Barter and his crew spent most of their duty hours in the shuttle bay, doing maintenance on their ship, a frigate-sized cargo vessel. Inez was glad. This meant she would have a wonderful view into the vastness of space for the whole trip. Once she took in a final view of Jupiter through the hangar bay doors, Inez reported for duty. Corporal Barter nearly jumped out of his skin when he saw Inez. What are you doing here? he asked, trying to ignore the stares and muttering of his shipmates. What happened to Cantrell? Someone high up swapped him out for me, Inez replied. I guess this will be my last training mission before I get a ship of my own. Inez reached into the pocket of her flight suit and withdrew her rank insignia, proving that she outranked Adam and his teammates. A dozen men and women all gasped in surprise. Why are you working down here with us, Commander? One of the mechanics asked. Shouldn't you be up on the bridge or something? Not wanting to give away her true intentions, Inez told a half-truth. Berlin wants me to observe you all, she said. Part of the training mission involves a new type of AI for the androids. We want to know how you're going to work with them. Three of the mechanics burst out laughing, and one of them pointed over his shoulder. You mean those androids, he said. They were doing so badly, we had to shut them off. And for the next hour or so, Inez, Adam, and their new companions had fun at the expense of the ship's android complement, nearly all of whom were either malfunctioning or just standing around, doing absolutely nothing. Without any ceremony, or even so much as a salute, the Charlemagne undocked from Port Armstrong and sped away from the Sol system. At one point, the ship's captain addressed the crew over the intercom. Attention à tous men! Now hear this! This is Captain Rashad Mubarak, French Air Force. We have now begun our scheduled exercise. While this is a training mission, we must train as we fight. The crew will observe a rule of radio silence that will be enforced by UN Marines. There will be no departures from the ship at any time unless authorized by myself in writing. All assignments will be handed out by your team leaders. Carry on. And with that, the hyperspace alarm started to blare, sending all crew members to their designated shelters. Once the crew of the Charlemagne were safely locked away in their lead-lined rooms, a quantum waveform swept over the battleship and it vanished into hyperspace. It took Inez about a day to start suspecting she had been taken for a ride. This was quite possibly the most boring mission she'd ever done, with each day being the exact same routine. Wake up, battle stations, mock combat against Partogan warships, lunch, battle stations again, mock combat 
this time against simulated Higarans. Dinner. Ship maintenance. Sleep. And the whole time, the Charlemagne continued flying towards an unknown destination. Throughout the journey, the battleship used its external holographic emitters to disguise itself, usually as cargo ships or mining vessels. To Inez's great disappointment, it was not possible to see these disguises from the inside of the hangar, and she only knew what today's camouflage was if she got to speak to a hologram technician. As it turned out, neither Adam nor any of his crew had the necessary clearance to access navigational charts, so Inez had no way of knowing where the battleship even was. When Inez realized that her mother had hustled her onto a starship and shot her off into constellations unknown, Inez excused herself, went to one of the gymnasiums in the living quarters, and as soon as she was alone, she burst into hysterical laughter. <laughs> Mom! Inez cackled to herself. That was not subtle at all! And now that she was out here with no way back to Earth, Inez fully accepted the fact that she had been duped. And duped hard. It was all clear now. For some reason beyond Inez, Scarlet needed to remove Inez not just from Cape Canaveral, but from Earth altogether. I'll bet it's got something to do with Cassandra, Inez grumbled. Mom needed me to get away from her, and I was stupid and didn't ask the right questions or something. Inez felt like punching a wall, and her anger threatened to make her blood boil. For the second time, she was separated from Cassandra without so much as a fight, and that made Inez very very angry. Somehow, the knowledge that someone was taking advantage of her was made even worse by the knowledge that there was nothing Inez could do about it. Pacing along the rows of treadmills, Inez looked out of a window at the stars. She was now so far away from Earth that the constellations she grew up with had distorted into unrecognizable shapes. The constellation Leo, the Great Lion, was the most distorted because the Charlemagne was flying directly toward it. Inez locked her eyes on the star known as Altair and silently swore an oath to herself. If she reunited with Cassandra, Inez was going to fight the next person who tried to separate them. Taking a deep, calming breath, Inez stepped away to find Adam. When the training exercise did not end after two weeks, Inez's worst fears seemed to be confirmed. It also annihilated crew morale aboard the Charlemagne. Hundreds of angry men and women complained to their superiors and demanded permission to call home and explain to their families why they were late in returning. The answer was always the same. The captain has ordered total radio silence. Resigned to her fate, Inez indulged herself in some selfish pleasure. She started an affair with Adam and made no effort to keep it a secret. After getting tricked into this boring detour of a mission, getting some level of control back into her life made Inez feel better. Plus, she and Adam got to cut loose and enjoy their free time while the rest of the crew was getting steadily more demoralized as the Charlemagne traveled farther and farther from Earth. June 26, 2086. Hakihea Star System. Sixteen days had gone by since the Charlemagne departed Jupiter. The crew was now so agitated at being late to return home that some people were intentionally slacking off on their jobs or refusing to work at all. Inez got her first good look at the hologram emitters when she woke up early in the morning. She had spent the night in Adam's bunk and needed the extra time to get dressed and sneak out of the men's sleeping quarters. Out in the corridor, 
Inez spotted a partially extended hologram array and the outermost edges of a projection from another array further aft. The battleship's disguise was only partially applied, and Inez got a small laugh trying to picture the vessel as half warship and half cargo hauler. Inez was about to move on when she spotted something she was not expecting to see, not in the slightest. It was a debris field. Some 200 starships were drifting derelict through the star system. Vessels of varying shapes and sizes were shot to pieces and abandoned. All that remained of some great battle fought here so long ago. Inez gasped as she spotted something behind the debris field. It was a small white orb, like a marble hiding in space. Inez had a very strong feeling that she knew exactly which planet she was looking at. She had seen it in a movie, a very popular action film from a few years ago, but she was struggling to remember the name. At that moment, the door behind her opened and several men emerged from the sleeping quarters. One of them gave a sly wink at Inez before moving on. Then Adam reappeared. He too was shocked at the sight of the planet below. Hey, Adam said in a groggy tone, isn't that the Partogan planet from that action movie? What's it called again? Sisters in Arms? Inez felt her blood run cold as with a dawning realization she replied, Faith in Chaos. The same moment, Mahurangi City, Auraki. For the past day, chaos had been unfolding in the streets of Mahurangi. The capital of the Commonwealth was beset by political turmoil as two rival political factions were taking advantage of a bad situation. Yesterday, the Kuhina Nui, leader of the royal government, suddenly died. Less than a full day after his death, Queen Marka had appointed a new Kuhina Nui to replace him. This made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. The streets of Mahurangi were filled with tens of thousands of angry protesters. Partogans, Kelt, Levakians, and Ashurians flooded the streets to make their displeasure known. It seemed as though nobody on Araki approved of the person Queen Marka picked to lead her government. Protesters were gathering outside of the royal palace. The National Assembly, the courts, news agencies, embassies, even the headquarters of the royal military. They were also massing outside the headquarters of the Triple Alliance. Triple Alliance HQ is a massive complex with dozens of buildings on the edge of the city, locked off behind a high wall. Alliance soldiers formed an additional cordon around the gate as angry civilians pressed toward the facility. Inside the command center, a group of military officers were watching the situation play out on a series of CCTV screens. Lavakian General McCavity, whose Triple Alliance uniform was adorned with the Galactic Defense Force symbols, shook his head in frustration. Protests like this have never happened before, McCavity grumbled. Why now? Why so seemingly out of nowhere like this? Other leaders were at a loss for words. Nobody knew why such a simple procedural decision would produce such an angry reaction from the people of Mahurangi. But after a few minutes of anxious waiting, a group of Triple Alliance soldiers burst into the command center with disturbing news. Sir, gasped a sergeant, we just detained one of the protesters. He looked like he was a ringleader, so we searched him and found this. The Partogan soldier held up a small metal card, about the size and shape of a playing card. One of the officers grabbed it and took a closer look. Then he looked up at General McCavity. Sir, this is an ISO blood chit, 
he said. There are human agents in the crowd. Agitators. McCavity took the blood chit. Sure enough, there was a message etched into the metal, written in the Partogan language. It promised the holder a reward from the UN government if they offered aid and assistance to the human carrying the blood chit. General McCavity looked up to say something to his fellow commanders, but a flicker of light on the CCTV screen caught his attention first. One by one, bright flashes of light lit up all of the screens. Several different sectors of the base were being subjected to fiery explosions, one after the other. Armed men were visible on the screens as well, shooting laser blasts as they went. Tails and whiskers shaking with fury, McCavity looked around the stunned Alliance leaders. Then he shouted at the top of his lungs, Are we blind? Deploy the garrison! Rafi Bakir was on the cusp of victory, and he knew it. Under his command, a strike team of UN Space Rangers was storming Triple Alliance HQ. Because of the riot taking place outside, none of the base defenders were ready for an armed assault by elite combatants. Moving swiftly and with precision, the human forces cut through the Partogan defenders. A squad of Levakian hunters, armed with slug thrower rifles, took up positions on the wall and tried to rain fire down on Rafi's team. Blaster launchers up front, Rafi ordered. A ranger trained his heavy weapon against the enemy and opened fire on the Levakians. With a great crash, the wall crumbled beneath the withering fire of the plasma weapon. This caused the Levakians to cease fire, mainly because they were now on the ground level, meaning the mob of protesters could reach them. Rafi ordered his team to refocus on their objective. While the first team provided covering fire, another group used breaching charges to knock down the door of one particular building. As soon as the door was open, Rafi ran inside of the Triple Alliance research facility and saw something that horrified him. The interior of the research facility was already wrecked. For a moment, he wondered if the complex was hit by a stray rocket, or if one of the shuttlecraft had accidentally collided with the building. Team 1, secure the pressure's cargo! Rafi barked to his troops. Everyone else? Contact front! Take cover! A group of soldiers emerged from the shadows and opened fire on the human strike team. The newcomers were space marines, outfitted with blue and silver power armor, adorned with the angel moon symbol. They wielded plasma rifles. Higarans! A ranger yelled. Look out! Those are Higarans at 12 o'clock! Forget that! Rafi yelled. We've got Partogans at our six! Partogans behind us! A three-way gunfight broke out. As smoke and fire enveloped the facility, Higaran Marines, Human Space Rangers, and Partogan Green Guards all engaged one another in a chaotic firefight that brought the walls and ceiling crashing down around them. Meanwhile, back on the Charlemagne, Inez and Adam reached their battle stations just before the alarm was raised. General Quarters! Captain Mubarak's voice called over the intercom. General Quarters, all hands to your battle stations. This is not a drill. I say again, this is not a drill. Inez and Adam rallied the rest of their crew while the hangar control officer piped his own voice over the intercom. Stand by for emergency incoming. This will be an uncontrolled landing. All hands to crash positions. A marine frigate rose up from the surface of Alraki. Inez could see it through the open hangar doors. Two Partogan starfighters were in hot pursuit, but they broke off as they came into the Charlemagne's weapon range. The incoming frigate accelerated as it closed in on the human battleship. Here they come, Adam yelled. Crash positions! Everyone in the hangar bay dove for cover as the speeding frigate careened into the hangar before landing on its belly. With a painful screeching noise and a spraying of sparks, the frigate skidded across the hangar floor before crashing into the far wall, which finally brought it to a stop. Inez, Adam, and the rest of their team closed in on the smashed frigate, 
racing to rescue the crew. Rafi Bakir stumbled out of the frigate's docking hatch and waved at Inez and Adam. Barter! Rafi yelled. Your precious cargo is over here! To Inez's surprise, Adam and all of his crew broke off from their rescue attempts and moved over to the cargo bay Rafi was pointing at. As they drew near, the door opened from the inside, revealing a very large object was hastily stored inside of the frigate. Adam shouted at his men to power up the robotic arm and get ready to move this thing onto Adam's ship, the Osiris. Wait a minute, Bakir, Adam called back. Where are the other two? Higarans had something to say about that, Rafi said. You focus on getting this thing ready for transport. While Adam and his crew prepared to extract the stadium-sized object from Rafi's frigate, Inez walked as close to the wrecked frigate as she could. She wanted to get a better look at the so-called precious cargo. She had recognized it instantly when the cargo doors opened. And now that she knew what it was, she understood why her mother had resorted to so much cloak and dagger. Inez had seen this thing in history books, on television, and learned about it during her tutoring at Banak base. She knew its history. She knew its significance. And now that it was on board the Charlemagne with her, Inez was feeling just the right amount of intimidation. Without realizing until it was too late, Inez participated in the theft of a progenitor hyperspace core. June 28th, 2086. The Bridge of Size, Higarin Empire. Erebic had missed the events on Araki. Her ship, the Frenzied Claw, was in hyperspace when the Charlemagne conducted its raid. But she was brought up to speed when she arrived at the Bridge of Size. The Bridge of Size is the name given to a massive network of defensive space stations around the planet Higara. Constructed by the old Tidan Empire centuries ago, these megalithic structures were often dozens, if not hundreds of kilometers in length and height, so large they could also function as hyperspace inhibitors. When the Frenzied Claw dropped out of hyperspace, a Higaran mothership was already flying out to meet her. Erebic stayed in her quarters and watched Xenonian news while the formalities were taken care of. When she learned about the death of Kuhina Nui Ranjinui, she quickly composed a message of condolences and then transmitted it to the Ozcox Embassy on the Angel Moon for approval. As for the riots and Araki and the subsequent attack, well, that made Erebic chuckle. To her, it was a distinct possibility that the human ISO had instigated the riot's planet side, which Erebic considered a clever move. She respected enemies who could manage such a feat. But at the same time, it was downright clumsiness that allowed the human raid to occur at the exact same moment as the Higaran one. For that, the humans lost a little of Erebic's respect. Yet, Erebic was able to appreciate how a 10-minute raid radically changed the balance of galactic power. Previously, the Partogans controlled all three of the Progenitor hyperspace cores, meaning they could travel to any location in the galaxy instantaneously. Now, the Core Trinity were split up. The Higarans managed to recover their own core, the one found on the desert world of Karak two centuries ago. And now, the humans had a core, most likely the one that previously belonged to the Vagar warlord Makan. Against the odds, the Partogans also managed to retain control of a core. So, now there are three star nations capable of far jumping, Erebic mused to herself. That changes things. She did not have much time to think about the massive sea change in galactic power balances, though. 
With a loud clanging noise and a heavy lurch, the frenzied claw docked with the Higaran mothership. A moment later, the captain's voice spoke over the intercom, summoning Erebic to Airlock 1. A group of Higaran marines were waiting in the airlock. They gave Erebic a suspicious glare until the frenzied clawed captain joined her. I am Captain Esan Rostami of the Yamadi warship Frenzied Claw. This is the Honorable Galactic Council Delegate Erebic from the Ozcox Diaspora. We are the only members of the crew authorized to interact with the classified cargo. The leader of the Higaran Marines pulled a slip of paper out of his pocket. You'll be adding two more names to that list, said the Marine. By order of Soban Kith Sa, you'll be taking on two more VIPs. Both of them have experience with Object 15 and are authorized to work with it. Captain Rostami seemed quite glad to have the extra help, but Erebic was annoyed. She wanted to limit the number of people who knew about her ghost signal project, and bringing Kith Soban into the fold was not part of her plan. Kith Soban was a warrior clan whose members often found employment as mercenaries. Ever since the Higaran Empire withdrew from the Galactic Defense Forces, the only Higarans remaining in the GDF were Soban mercenaries like the ones standing before her. And Erebic did not trust any soldier who was loyal to money instead of a flag. Once the captain agreed to take on the new VIPs, Object 15 and its two escorts were moved from the mothership to the Frenzied Claw. Object 15 was very small, about the size of a fully grown Tidani man, and it was pushed along on a wheeled cart, covered by a heavy tarp. Flanking it on either side were two people, an elderly Higaran man and an iridescent looking Saibon. The Higaran's body was so completely covered in tattoos that it was impossible to determine his skin color. His Saibon counterpart had vivid plumage that seemed to reflect light no matter what direction he faced. His eyes were also a terrifying shade of blood red. The Saibon bowed his head and introduced himself. My name is Eyes of Red, former military engineer of the Saibon Confederation. Now I work for the Research and Development Division of the Emerald Institute. I've been studying Object 15 for the past decade. The heavily tattooed Higaran introduced himself next. Captain Lavir Paktu, Higaran Navy, he said. Erebic's eyes widened. She knew this person, but never met him before. Lavir was a genetic clone of Ariok Soban Ray, a Higaran war hero who died over a century ago. He rose to fame during his service aboard the Higaran mothership Pride of Higara during the Vagar War, which meant that he was physically present when the object called Object 15 was first discovered. Lavere was quite old now, having lived far beyond the lifespan of the man he was cloned from. Lavere put one hand on the tarp covering Object 15. It's been too long. Lavir said, I can't wait to see this thing in action again. Object 15 was carted down to the Frenzied Claws hyperspace module. Erebic held her personal hard drive close and watched as Lavir and Eyes of Red worked together to unpack their valuable cargo. I've heard stories about this thing, Captain Rastami said. I've always wanted to see it for myself. You just want to see it, Erebic said. I want to use it. With a flourish, Lavere pulled the tarp away, revealing the true identity of Object 15. It was the Oracle. The Oracle was a small relic created by the now defunct Progenitor Empire. Nobody was sure exactly how old this thing was, but it was most likely over a million years old. Despite its size, roughly equal to that of Lavere, 
the Oracle contained an incredibly powerful computer that was highly intelligent, if not sentient. Seventy years ago, Lavir and his starship, the Pride of Hegara, fought a vicious battle for control of the Oracle. And now, he looked at the Progenitor computer as though it were an old friend. How does it work? Erebic asked. Do we just plug in the ghost signal and wait for the Oracle to run a calculation? Kind of, Eyes of Red replied. There is one more step you have to do. You have to give the Oracle full access to the ship's computer, Lavir said. That includes your drive system and hyperspace module. What? Captain Rastami roared. You want me to let a million-year-old computer take my ship for a joyride? Lavir and Eyes of Red nodded grimly. Erebic sighed and held out her hard drive. If this gets us to the bottom of this ghost signal, she said, then we should get started. Up on the bridge, the Chief of the Watch was patiently waiting for the captain to return when a series of alarms suddenly started blaring. Sir, an officer yelled, we have a hyperdrive malfunction. Emergency override isn't responding. A wave front is forming. It's like we're being forced to jump into hyperspace. Captain Rastami's voice piped into the bridge through a speaker. Nobody touch the controls, he ordered. Turn on the autopilot and get to your hyperspace shelters. We're jumping in eight minutes. Moving under the Oracle's command, the frenzied claw undocked from the Hagaran mothership and, minutes later, was swiftly enveloped by a quantum wavefront, disappearing into hyperspace. <laughs>